Hello and welcome. I'm Real Crowd CEO Adam Hooper, and this is the Real Estate Investing for Your Future podcast. Here we explore the latest in commercial real estate trends, insights, and investment strategies that passive investors can use to build real estate portfolios that last. All opinions expressed by Adam, Tyler, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Real Crowd. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. To gain a better understanding of the risks associated with commercial real estate investing, please consult your advisors. Our guest today is David Kahn, Director of Market Analytics at the CoStar Group. In today's conversation, David discusses the current state of the office market, the impact the pandemic has had, and what factors he believes investors should be focusing in on. Be sure to check the show notes for links discussed in the episode to learn more about David and everything CoStar is up to. We hope you enjoyed today's episode with David Kahn. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's it's great to be back here in the studio in, in early 2022, and, and we appreciate you taking the time to share with us what you're up to and the work that you guys are doing at, uh, at CoStar Group. So thanks for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. So before we jump in, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into real estate uh, and, and more more specifically the the path that you've taken at CoStar. I think um, that's going to be interesting to get some of your insights from, uh, from, from deep within. Well, I actually, graduating from college, I was a political science major and I've had interest in many different subjects over the years, really history, geography, politics, and economics in particular. And if you think about it, real estate combines all of those interests into one. And as many people who I've talked to in the commercial real estate industry weren't necessarily looking into real estate right out of school, and I follow that similar path as well. So early in the career, when, in my career, when I had the opportunity to join CoStar and, and learn the industry from the inside out, I took advantage of that and started in CoStar's research department, mm -hmm. actually gathering the data uh, for our analyst team to analyze and then quickly moved to the market analytics side of CoStar. And, and so tell us a little bit about the different, you know, CoStar has been on an acquisition spree uh, last handful of years. Tell us a little bit about maybe the universe of, of different verticals within CoStar. Um, and then we'll dig in a little bit more. We've been a user of CoStar for forever. Um, we can talk a little bit more about CoStar specifically and some of the research and, and analytics that you guys are, are collecting. Well, CoStar, we do have a lot of different brands out there. So, of course, CoStar, which is data analytics really driving for the commercial real estate professional, but of course we have LoopNet as well, which is the commercial marketplace. We have 10X, which is also a commercial marketplace, biz buy sell. We recently acquired homes.com and that's been a big push lately into the single family market, but we also own apartments.com. So, mm -hmm. you know, Brad Bellflower and the apartments.com commercials that everyone sees uh, throughout, throughout the year and, and during big events, you know, that's CoStar as well. So with that and how that translates to what I do is a lot of the data that we're able to, to play around with is coming from both those marketing websites, so apartments.com, LoopNet, 10X, and are also being driven and, and gathered by our research team. So having all of these different platforms feeding us data, it gives mm -hmm. us such a wealth of information to take and analyze and make sense of, of commercial real estate with. Yeah, and that, that's what's been interesting to me is to see you know, it sounds like when, when you started with CoStar, right, in, in the early days of CoStar, it was a lot of calling, right? It, it's, it's internal reps are, are calling brokers or calling owners um, to, to do kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat to get to that data. And now to see what CoStar has grown into with all these different avenues that are massive, massive feeds of data. Um, it's just been, it's been fun to watch that aggregation play and, and seeing all these different different areas of data that, that CoStar can can now aggregate. So why don't you tell us a little bit? So when you got started, you were you were in those rooms calling calling on folks that uh, I'm sure many of our listeners have maybe even received calls from from CoStar to verify comps or sales transactions. Um, tell us a little bit about what that looked like and then how that transitioned into more of what you're doing now on the the market analytics side of the house. Well, it was a great opportunity to learn how CoStar's 
data gathering happens from, from the ground up, and that's been instrumental and has really helped my career as an analyst because I not only understand where the data is coming from, from the research side as well as our client side, but I, I really can get my hands dirty and see and re-verify and check out to see if net absorption trends are exactly what's going on in the market, if leasing is trending in a specific way, construction, it really has helped me understand the market from that from that ground up perspective and mm-hmm. from taking a look on a building level, bringing that out to a sub market or a market, and then getting the macro view of say the national office market, having that real understanding of how to gather the data and what that means for the sector, the commercial real estate sector as a whole has been been very valuable for me in my career here. Yeah, and we've talked a lot on the past of, on the show about the the market reports that CoStar puts out, uh, invaluable information. I know some of those are available to public, some of those are available only to subscribers. So um, we'll have links in the show notes here for any of the listeners that want to see some of the work that CoStar puts together for just high level market analyses. Um, really, really, really good information and, and tons of of really key insights into how those markets are operating. And today, I think we're going to take a little bit of a focus on the office market, which has been, to me, one of the more, uh, I guess, still unknown <laughs> asset classes as we're now two years into the, you know, since the pandemic started back in, in 2020. Um, what has the impact been on office space? And, and there's a lot of different avenues to look at that through. But I think just generally, what have you seen as it relates to the office market um, with the impact of, of the pandemic? Well, the big word is still uncertainty. And that sounds like a broken record when you say that over and over again. But really, with the trajectory of the pandemic and the initial impact of the pandemic, with how we, we haven't really gotten back to normal yet with the new mm-hmm. variants, with the vaccines, we haven't returned to normal just yet. So even though we're starting to get a handle of what's going on in the market, we still don't know what the long-term impact of the pandemic is on work trends in general, and in particular, how that impacts office use. So initially, when the pandemic hit, leasing fell off a cliff, very slow leasing volume, which led to negative net absorption, lots of move outs, downsizings. But since then, we have seen an uptick in leasing activity Firms are starting to feel more confident about what their future office footprints will look like and whether that means a reduction in space or an expansion. They're starting to understand that now about two years in. Uh, But we're still below the pre-pandemic norm that we saw from about 2016 to 2019 in terms of overall leasing volume. Mm -hmm. Until we get back up to that pre-pandemic pace, it's probably going to be a relatively slow recovery from the initial hit that we saw in 2020 through early 2021. And now you mentioned there are some office space reductions, footprint reductions, and maybe even some expansions. I, I think that's been still one of those unknowns is, is the use of the office space, right? Are we going to look at a footprint that's going to be reduced because we're going to have more remote work and we're going to have less people nine to five in the office every day? Um, or are we, are we going to need a, a larger footprint because of how we're going to program the space and what we're going to do in the space is a different look than it was pre-pandemic. Um, still too early to see any trends there, or have you seen any trends of general patterns of, of reduction across or, or expansion in some areas or, or maybe even by industry? Have you seen any, any unique insights on that front? I think the important aspect of, of looking at that is it is really dependent on the individual company. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very difficult to draw conclusions, even on industries at this point, because if you look at the headlines and you would see uh, someone like a, a Twitter or a certain tech company say, we're going, a- anyone could work from anywhere indefinitely into the future. And then of course, everyone else hops on that bandwagon. <laughs> well, what we've seen recently is tech companies like Meta, like Apple, like Google, Microsoft, they're the ones who are leading in terms of office space leasing, but also office space acquisitions, investing into physical office spaces, building that out or building out campuses uh, in physical office space. So it's 
very important to look at those headlines and maybe there, some of the headlines are clickbait in a lot of ways and people are seeing what's going on, but to then parse out the data and look to see if that actually justifies what mm -hmm. that what that narrative is is pushing right now. And as of right now, yes, there is slow releasing volume. Yes, more firms are looking to potentially go to a flex or a remote setup, but has that actually led to a sharp reduction in, in space use in terms of le overall leasing? Not necessarily, and things have flattened out and, and started to stabilize over the past couple quarters. And so when you look at those acquisitions of office space and, and leasing activity increasing in some of those bigger tech companies that are at the same time saying that we're going to be remote forever, potentially. Um, what is, what's causing that? Is it a value play? Is it they can acquire space now at a discount to maybe where they were before? And they're just, is that growth still just that intense that they need that much more space, even with an unknown or uncertain uh, physical office need in the future? I think that's absolutely part of it. And I also think that with a lot of firms that are thinking in the future and, and once we're once we're past Omicron and, and any other future variants as mass mandates are lifted, as we start to get back to normal, these firms are looking at what what's their workforce going to look like mm -hmm. two, three, five, ten years down the road and when they want to bring people back to the office and when people would want to come back to the office, even if they are working two, three days in the office, they want to be in the top tier space in a lot of cases, they want to be able to recruit people to come to the office and feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you know, it's worth investing in that for those certain firms, because if you think about physical office space for many companies out there, it's a drop in the bucket compared to labor costs. And as we're seeing with the labor market right now and white collar labor as, as well as blue collar labor, it's very difficult to hire. And that fight for talent, that, that challenging environment has persisted over the, since the pandemic. And it's going to be of heightened importance in the near term. And if you look at office using employment, office using employment right now is about 1.5% above where it was nationally in February, 2020. The national average for employment is about 2% below still. So hmm. office using sectors or office using jobs have bounced back a lot quicker. And it is becoming a lot more competitive for firms, not just your tech giants, but really anyone who you can consider professional services, financial activities to find that high quality labor. And part of that formula is physical office space and having an environment where people feel comfortable, safe to collaborate in the future. Yeah, that's that's I hadn't I hadn't thought through that before of <clears throat> pre pandemic office space was just it was a given, right? I mean, it was nothing. It was neither a tool or a. I mean, I guess if you're in like a really, really bad office space, that could be a detractor. But it wasn't really something that was like a, a crucial recruiting tool, right? <laughs> and now it almost seems that, like you just mentioned, as we get back into this, because in person work has become somewhat of a a different, not a, it's not a requirement necessarily as much anymore, right? So, so to be able to have an environment where if you're going to require people to be in a physical office, how important that is, right? From a making it desirable for people to come work there uh, as a, as even as a recruiting tool, that's actually a really interesting point of why you're seeing maybe more um, upgrading to, to higher quality. And I guess maybe does that, have you seen that bear out as you look at uh, across a different, um, office classes between your know, class A, B, and C? Have you seen a, a breakdown of activity trending more towards A or, or people moving, you know, upgrading into nicer spaces? Have we seen people that are maybe downgrading into, into less space, less qu lower quality space? Like, I'm just curious, how does that look across the different quality of asset classes? Well, it does depend on the, the individual firm and to that point of certain companies still flocking to that quality space in your downtown or downtown adjacent areas if they're recruiting a certain talent pool let's say recent college grads from an engineering school they want to be near that location in the hip urban area mm -hmm. while maybe a certain other firm which is more back office operations maybe they want to go to more of a hub and spoke model where they have a lot of different suburban offices or they're able to utilize a co-working space for that, those types of those types of workers who are out in the suburbs and have 
school-aged children and, and value that flexibility now compared to maybe three, four years ago. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the, the quality of office space, I think another important trend that we've been tracking recently is the fact that firms who are reducing space or making these decisions, they're not doing it out of financial stress at this point. Most companies are doing very well uh, during or during the pandemic and now coming into the economic recovery, the economy is is trending in the right direction, uh, all things considered. And firms who are possibly looking for a move or, or looking for a reduction in space, they're not doing it out of uh, financial uh, downturns like we mm-hmm. saw in 2008, 2009. This is more they're looking to sp- to adjust to the new labor environment and to adjust to the new world. So I think that's important to keep in mind when thinking about class A, class B, class C. It really, there's less price sensitivity. Firms, of course, they want to get a good deal if they possibly can, um, which is also a reason why we've we've seen a lot of sublet leasing recently. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the flight to quality, the flight to quality has persisted. And companies that want to be in that top tier location, the top tier space having rents sky high rents is they're not really blinking an eye at that at this point mm-hmm. yeah and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the the sublease activity i know that was huge in the early stages of the pandemic i'm curious if that's calmed down at all or if it's if it's continued but uh, before we get to that maybe we can talk a little bit just geographically how you've seen across the u.s um are certain areas performing better than others are you seeing a differentiator between you, know, you mentioned kind of urban you more hip office space for for attracting maybe the younger kind of tech or engineering talent. Um, what are you seeing geographically in terms of, of how office space is holding up? Sunbelt markets have clearly outperformed so far. Uh, a lot of markets, basically every metro was hit by the initial effects of the pandemic, vacancies rising pretty much everywhere. We saw some negative net absorption and flattening rent growth, but at this point, two years in, the markets that are further out in front of the recovery are your Miami's, Salt Lake City, uh, Atlanta, Nashville have been really leaders in terms of the office recovery with demand returning, leasing activity returning to normal. And then your expensive gateway markets, New York, San Francisco, DC, a lot in a lot of cases and, and what I talking to a lot of people still on the ground, you know, certain downtown areas still have very low office usage and people still haven't come back in mass like they have in the Sunbelt market. So uh, a lot of metros are still shedding space in terms of net absorption while your Sunbelt markets in Florida, in Arizona, Georgia, Tennessee, Texas are now on the leading edge of, of positive net absorption. So there's been mm-hmm. a pretty big difference in terms of performance just over the past couple quarters or so. And and what do you think is is driving that? Um, you know, like you said, the Sun Belt states, um, some of these other ones, what, Salt Lake, I, I don't know if I'd consider that a Sun Belt <laughs> necessarily. Um, but what, um, what are you seeing that's driving some of those markets that are doing better or, or holding back markets that maybe aren't uh, recovering as quickly? Well, many Sun Belt, Sun Belt markets such as Dallas, Fort Worth, Atlanta, Nashville, they've been magnets for corporate relocations for, for decades now. And that trend has, has really persisted over the past 10 years or so. And still you're seeing a, a migration of corporations and jobs, mm-hmm. uh, white collar jobs to Sunbelt markets. So for example, in Nashville, uh, which has added 80% office using employment since 2010. So office using employment wow. increasing by 80% just in just over the past decade or so similar in Austin you're seeing major tech companies relocate or expand operations in an Austin in a Nashville that's helped drive demand and office uses as well but I think part of it it is a cultural factor and a lot of uh, markets that are more dependent on public transit and are more densely populated whether that initial uh, the initial impact of COVID really did cause hesitancy. There has been hesitancy to get back to normal and and to come back to the office. So Mm -hmm. I think a little bit of that is is cultural and it depends on the the specific geography, but 
you know, in general, that is something that we have seen and noticed. It's, you know, the Sunbelt markets really get starting to get back to, to, to normalcy quicker than your gateway markets overall. Mm -hmm. And now when we look at the transactional volume, you'd mentioned, anyway, we'll talk a little about leasing, but I'm curious from the, the sales transaction volume, you mentioned some of the bigger tech companies making a pretty big move to acquire space. Um, what have you seen, I guess, from just investment volume and, and kind of any kind of investor sentiment, I guess? And I don't know if you guys track anything like that, but just anecdotally, I'm curious what you've seen in, in investor sentiment towards office. Is there a, is it contrarian right now? I mean, is there, is there, is there, is there a contrarian play or are there that much value out there right now in terms of, of trying to take advantage of some of this uncertainty? Well, office volume slowed quite substantially in the early months of the pandemic, lots of uncertainty uh, with uh, the capital markets there, but things have started to return to normal recently. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what's driving the uptick in sales volume is confidence in net leased trophy towers, leased to, to credit tenants essentially. So uh, investors feeling more confident in a, a long-term lease in a class A location with a class A building. Mm -hmm. That has driven a substantial portion of transaction activity there has been some value seeking. There hasn't been some um, some B and C class in the suburbs selling, but really to a positive sign of there, we haven't seen much in terms of dis distress sales. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing uh, banks retaking the keys from uh, from investors. Everyone's generally well capitalized, and most tenants are solvent and paying rent. So that has been a a really stabilizing force for the capital markets in the office sector. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking forward because of the way office leases roll over, you know, we might not see distress come out for, for years to come just because mm -hmm. of the fact that even if companies do start to shed space more in certain areas, you have plenty of time to react to that. And so for listeners out here that are, are maybe looking at investing in an office property or managers that are acquiring office properties where we stand today what are some of the metrics that are most interesting to you or that that maybe people can can take a look at or start to think about that they maybe weren't before in a in the you know, pre-pandemic world um any kind of key metrics that you're watching now or you think are, are interesting for people that may be interested in investing in office space I think you touched on one thing that I've been looking at least recently is the run up in values for multifamily and industrial over the past few years has been absolutely tremendous. And if you look at office, office values have held steady and increased slightly, which might surprise some people. But you know, looking at an office building that apples for apples, apples to apples was trading uh, for a similar price that it did in 2019. Well, if you compared that to the overall CRE world, other than hotels, office values are, appear to be a relative bargain compared to a few years ago. So if you can get the same building at a same same value or a same cap rate today than you could have in 2018, 2019, um, that's potentially value going forward as long as you're confident that you'll be able to keep maintain occupancy and eventually push rents once things get back to normal mm -hmm. just because multifamily values have skyrocketed and industrial is now becoming such a hot property type as well and you know that's something that we expect to continue because listening to all of these investment calls and all of these earnings calls all the national international investment firms want to pour more capital into multifamily. They want to diversify their portfolios by putting more money into industrial. And for those investing in office, well, if there's you know less capital out there, maybe there's more advantages or opportunities for you to invest in office uh, compared to maybe a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and now switching a little bit to the the leasing side of the market, um, you know, we. we mentioned the sub sublet activity and and i'm curious what if we look at the occupancy rate versus actual usage right what is what I'm, I'm curious, is that anything you guys track in terms of what the actual usage of space is relative to the occupancy of space and, and is that a maybe more 
relevant metric to be looking at right now rather than just pure occupancy vacancy rates? When looking at the sublet market, I mean, the sublet market has increased substantially, almost doubled since the start mm -hmm. of the pandemic. So we're tracking about two, 200 million square feet of sublet availability while in 2019, we were a little bit above 100 million. So if you think about that and you think about companies that are, are either looking to reduce their footprints or are just fishing to see what's out there, and that's a big question that we've gotten, how many of these companies are, are really, they do want to forego that space and they do want to just go either pure remote or mostly flex, or are they just seeing if they can get someone to backfill and maybe they'll adjust from there. And we mm -hmm. have seen some companies put space out for sublet, withdraw, and then expand into the same building or a nearby building as well. So there's still a lot of figuring it out with when it comes to the sublet market. When it comes to the actual physical usage, everyone seems to cite the Castle Systems data, which shows that office usage is slowly climbing up. Um, but I, I'm not sure how indicative that is of the overall office leasing, because what we're finding is even in the cities where office usage is still 40%, 50% of pre-pandemic norms, well, leasing volume is back up to normal. So hmm. you wouldn't have companies lease space like they were back in 2018, 2019, if they wouldn't eventually think that they were going to come back to either close to full usage or uh back to full uh, pre-pandemic usage. And I'm, I'm curious, when you look at some of these sublet opportunities, where are those amounts relative to their contract rents? So are people trying to offload space and just save money? Or are they looking, I mean, there's not an arbitrage where <laughs> have office rents gone <laughs> up for some of these? Or is it um, kind of trying to just get out at, at market rents? Or what is that dynamic looking like? By and large, the sublet space is leasing for a discount compared to your relet space in, in a similar building or, mm -hmm. or the same building. So that is challenging for owners to, to contend with because in a lot of cases, if you have a sublease, if you have a floor, then, and if you're a tenant and you're looking for space and you want to plug and play, get right into that new building right away, well, a lot of times those sublet spaces, they come with furniture, they come ready to go and ready to be used right away and you don't have to negotiate necessarily you could just take take over the lease in a lot of cases so that can be an advantage for uh for certain firms that are looking for space and we have seen firms gravitate to that sublet space actually the percent of rba the percent of space leased as sublet lease compared to overall leasing is at a record high right now Mm -hmm. So more firms looking for, for sublet space, whether it's for a discount or and or for that kind of plug and play mentality of you're able to to get right in, start your operation right away. You don't have to wait for someone to move out necessarily. Um, you don't have to wait for another lease to roll over. You can just take over that lease and and uh, go, go from there. And then you mentioned earlier a little bit about the some of the pain, not necessarily pain, but some of the effects of what's going on right now might not be felt for a few years just due to the, the length and the longer term nature of office leases relative to something like multifamily. Um, maybe for listeners that aren't, aren't as familiar with what that velocity might be, can you kind of compare a little bit of uh, how you typically see an office lease playing out versus something like a multifamily or maybe even industrial? Absolutely. Most office leases, they're going to be signed at a minimum for, for five, three, five, ten, sometimes longer. So mm -hmm. if you're locked into that lease, it's very difficult to, to break that lease because of um, regulations there and what you've negotiated with the landlord. So unlike multifamily, where if economic stress happens and you know you, you have a lot of individuals who are on one-year leases, well, it's easier to either either break that lease or to then after the lease is over just just move out for hotels our, our national director of hotel analytics he likes to say we only have one day leases so as we mm -hmm. saw with the hotel market right when the pandemic hit you saw all indicators basically fall off a cliff and now they're slowly recovering back to normal 
office is, is definitely on the complete other side of that spectrum when you have longer term leases. And important for, for owners, a lot of these office leases in a specific building, if you have a multi-tenant building, they're staggered. So you don't have one big tenant just moving out in most buildings across the country. You have mm -hmm. multi-tenant buildings where leases are expiring over time. Sometimes you backfill that space right away. Sometimes it takes a little bit of while to backfill that certain space, but you usually have a lot more lead time to backfill space because you know when that when your tenant is going to to not renew and when you're going to be able to market that space and you then have some more lead time before that uh, that vacancy hits the mark hits your specific building and impacts you financially mm -hmm. and that's one of the i think one of the most important charts or, or graphs to look at in any office acquisition is what your rent roll timeline looks like right understanding how much term do you have left on those leases is that rent roll going to be the you know, turnover going to be pretty chunky are you going to lose you know 50 60 70 percent of your of your leases in one year or is it pretty smoothed out where you don't have any major chunks of of space coming up you know in any particular calendar year so i think that's definitely a, a key area to look at for for listeners that are maybe looking at an office investment um and, and how have you seen have you have you seen that kind of insulate I guess somewhat the the office space during the pandemic if you have these longer term leases um, sure if you had some uh, expirations in the last year or two that's going to be space that you're likely not going to see a renewal on um, but for office owners that have had longer term leases how has that insulated them during the pandemic with what we've seen. We definitely have. And, and again, we haven't seen, we have seen a run up in vacancy, but we haven't seen it uh, maybe the, to the point where the headlines would like you to believe, you know, most, most owners are still doing well. Most uh, tenants are still paying rent, whether they're subletting space or looking to sublet or not, um, you know, they're still on the hook for that. So what I've seen too recently is in certain cases where companies are looking to expand, you have a case where a firm is looking to sublet a decent amount of space in the market. If you're looking to land a larger tenant, you can possibly use that as to your advantage and put together a few contiguous spaces, maybe a floor or two for a tenant mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been able to expand in your building before. But now that a company is looking to downsize, you could take back that space and put together a, a couple floors in, in one building while traditionally maybe they would have had to go into multiple buildings or not contiguous space. So you know, we saw that in a couple cases here in Atlanta up in Central Perimeter where there was a big sublet listing. Part of that space was leased. Part of it was actually used to put together one contiguous space for a new tenant to move into where they didn't have that much space to, to lease in that building before the pandemic happened. So maybe that building wouldn't have landed this new, new to market tenant. Mm -hmm. And then I guess a, a little bit on, on what we talked about before, I'm, I'm just curious to get a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of what you're seeing in rental rates. Um, uh, remaining flat, seeing some reductions in, in new leases. Are you seeing any increases? What, what are you seeing on the rental rate side of the world? Well, owners and landlord brokers have really held firm with rents and our rent series, our asking rent series has shown essentially flat rents since the start of the pandemic, which might mm -hmm. surprise a lot of people. It is. And yeah, when I you mean, can sit. I know we even just, again, because we, we were one of those tenants that had our lease that did expire in, uh, I guess that was late 2020, our lease expired. And yeah, we were looking for a new space and we're like, what the heck? Why, <laughs> why are there no deals out here? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was shocked at how flat uh, the rents had remained. And, and one of the main reasons for that is what happened back in 09, 2010, and really up until the market started turning around in around 2013, 14, you had a situation where a lot of companies, a lot of firms were locking in, or a lot of owners were locking in firms to well below market rents. And in, instead of having well below market rents now, we're giving or owners are giving a little bit more free rent up front, a little bit more free rent, possibly on the back end, additional TIs, because that 
would indicate that the firm that's taking that space, they're investing in that space with you, in, in, if you will, and are willing to say, hey, if you're giving me some more TIs, you're giving me a few months free up front, I'm more willing to stick it out and stay mm -hmm. and, and keep this office space for the remainder of the lease, which is, for, for a longer term, definitely a, a good thing to have someone who's a good tenant staying in there and you know, not looking to sublet space uh, in, in that specific building. So I think you know, a lot of owners, they learn their lesson from the previous downturn where you had all these below market rent, below market rent leases. And then all of a sudden, once the market started getting hot again in, in 2016, 2017, 2018, those renewals were, were pretty big sticker shocks to those tenants. Mm -hmm. And we've by and large avoided that in a lot of cases and have instead uh, owners have generally opted for the, the concessions, the TIs, uh, as well as early in the pandemic, more short-term renewals so that mm -hmm. you're kicking the can, can down the road until things start to normalize. You're not locking into something well below market for five, 10 years. Yeah, I think from a <clears throat> supporting building value as well, right? If you have a lower a lower lease rate that you're locked into, that's going to affect your your value of your building versus keeping those rents higher and, and offering some of those concessions, right? Maybe it's just perceptual. And if you really dig in behind the numbers, you'll see what the, the net effect is. But I think there is definitely some desire, I think, as an extension of what you're talking about, right? In the last cycle, when they were doing these low lease rates, um, you know, that directly affects the value of your building if you look on it, you know, on a cap rate basis. So um, having, I think, those rents stay high, but offering some concessions. That's certainly what we saw here in, in our local market. Um, so how about pipeline, supply pipeline? Um, you know, with two, you said 200 million square feet of sublet space. Um, I can't imagine there's a ton of new office development going on right now, but I'm, I'm curious, are, are there any indications of, of new supply coming online or any, um, you know, murmurs of, of new development coming back. We've certainly seen it. Industrial has, has you know, just continued. You can't build enough fast enough. Um, multifamily, <laughs> we're starting to see a lot more in that space from, from new construction as well. But what are you seeing in the office market with uh, new new projects coming online? There is, a, there is actually a lot of office space under construction. About 140 million square feet is underway right now. And about 35% of that is spec. So about 35% mm. unleased. And perhaps more importantly, about a quarter or 25% of space that's delivered since the start of 2020 is still unleased. So supply will, will continue to be a factor. Now, part of that is office space is generally, in particular, the office space that's being built now, very high quality, very uh, typically going to be in your, your class A submarkets, class A locations. Mm -hmm. uh, you have materials costs, which have gone up. You have labor costs, which have gone up. Uh, construction timelines have been extended since the pandemic because no one's really been in a, in a huge rush to deliver speculative supply since the start of the pandemic. But, you know, lo looking forward, because there's such long lead times for office development, it's going to take a while for that for that pipeline to, to, to peter off. And you know, there are good reasons to believe that developers will, will continue to break ground on office space because mm -hmm. of that flight to quality trend that we've seen. And the fact that if you're going to be in a class A location and build the, the best building on the block, and when you deliver, you have these tenants who are willing to pay up for the to be in the class A address, uh, you know, that could still be an effective option for, for a lot of developers out there. Yeah, it gets back to what we were talking about before of, again, you know, office space kind of being this amenity now, being a an attractor, a recruiting tool of, of having the nicest, newest, shiniest, you know, most, you know, most friendly uh, office environment. Um, and I'm assuming there's a similar dynamic as what we're seeing on the multifamily side of new construction. You, you can't you can't make a class B or C project pencil. Right. So all the new construction on the multifamily side is going to be that higher class A luxury type property. It sounds like a similar dynamic in the office space. Are you seeing any deliveries coming down the line that are not kind of the newer class A flashier space? It's, it's mostly that. And then you do have certain areas where if you look at mixed use developments, and we've seen a lot of suburban mixed use 
projects, uh, particularly in the Sun Belt, but then we're also seeing it in some Midwestern, Northeastern markets right now. You know, traditionally you would have a certain ratio of office to multifamily. Well, that's shifted a lot more towards multifamily recently and, mm-hmm. and retail as well. Um, but those are the types of products. Maybe it's maybe maybe it's not your Class A trophy in your downtown submarket, but it's still nice quality space, and it will come equipped with all of these breathable, livable. Uh, lifestyle type amenities that everyone will want when they're coming back to the office as well. So um, it's it's being more selective with development. It's not building your, you know, tilt wall, three-story office buildings that we see that were built out in the 1990s during the tech boom, right? Mm-hmm. We're not seeing that anymore. Either Whether it's a, a creative loft office or a conversion from multifamily or, or um, excuse me, conversion from industrial uh, adaptive reuse um, it's going to be some high quality space with Mm -hmm. some kind of walkability uh, or amenity on site or right nearby Um, so I know know you've got a plane to catch here in a few minutes so maybe we talked a little bit about some of the factors that you're tracking any other either demographics or, or you know higher level job metrics that you're looking at uh, for listeners out there that are thinking about investing in the office market? Um, any other interesting data points that, that you're tracking that they maybe want to pay attention to and, and also some sources, you know, obviously CoStar being one of them, um, but some other alternative sources for, for accessing some of those data points? I think leasing activity is the main leading indicator that I, that I always point to, whether it's on a, on a real macro level like national office market, or if you're looking on a market level or a submarket, so looking at leasing compared to historical norms, because mm-hmm. once that leasing gets back up to, to to a normal level, the more churn there is in the market, the better it is for you as as an office owner. You you want companies looking for more space. You want to be able to take take uh, capitalize on that to either you know have expansions or to raise rents. Um, also checking in terms of the uh, a metric that I watch closely is office using employment, and that's professional and business services, financial activities, and information, and whether that means the people who are employed in those sectors are using physical office space or a hybrid or a remote. The stronger the growth is for office using employment, the more likely it is for specific MSA to see an up, uptick in terms of office leasing and office mm-hmm. net absorption and office usage. So those are those are the two big leading indicators that I, I like to look at and I would recommend looking at. And of course, the office using employment that's from the BLS, the leasing activity would would be through CoStar. Perfect. Yeah, I think those are those are great data points to consider. Um, so before we let you out of here, why don't you let us know what uh, what is keeping you up at night as it relates to the state of the office market right now? It goes back to the demographic and demographic growth and the and the labor shortages. We've seen a a pretty substantial slowdown in population growth. Some of that is due to the pandemic and the lack of of immigration. But you know, long term. We need a growing population to drive our economy, and that's for both blue collar sectors and white collar sectors. And that competitive environment will make it more difficult for office users to hire up to scale. And if you mm-hmm. can't hire office workers, well, you don't need to expand into more office space. So, you know, if, if I were if I owned an office building, you know, that would be what would keep me up at night. And, and when mm-hmm. looking at it from our perspective, right, it's you need more people working in office using sectors to uh, justify more office space going forward. And then what, uh, what has you the most optimistic right now? Well, for the office market, values have held up and rents have generally held up relatively well. Leasing is improved, so that has me optimistic. And, and really what has me more optimistic than anything is that Remote flex work, it will remain a factor. But as you mentioned earlier, Adam, you know, that's an amenity as well. So it's all this this flight to quality and flight to quality in terms of both the physical office space, but also, you know, people's livelihoods and, and what people are looking for going forward. And because the labor market is so tight, you know, companies will want to look to expand into 
into areas where their their employees want to be and -hmm. whether that is allowing for them to be possible flex or or a little bit remote or, or what have you having that home base of an office building to come back to to collaborate in you know that's something that we've seen and we've heard from 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 tenants from ceos down to, to small mom and pops who, who lease office space that's really something that's that's valued and in 2022 you know looking forward hopefully with all these mass mandates starting to be lifted as we get back to normal there i think there's going to be a a push to return to normalcy in all of our lives and that there were some good things that came out of the pandemic but there's a lot of negative that came out of the pandemic as well and mm-hmm. you know one of the things looking forward i think people are really uh, anticipating is through the end of this year once we get back to normal having a, a routine a schedule that we can rely on and part of that is is going back to the office you know i know we're certainly uh looking forward to figuring out what that new normal is. So whenever you, whenever you guys nail that and you figure out what it is, let us know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be keeping a close eye on it for sure. Um, well, I think that's a, that's a great place to wrap up. Um, why don't you tell the listeners how, how they can learn more about what you're up to with CoStar and, and get access to some of the, the really just fantastic work that you guys are putting out in the analytics side. Absolutely. CoStar.com, loopnet.com, 10X, Biz by sell from a commercial perspective, and then for the housing, apartments.com, homes.com, all, all of our other brands right there. But we, we've been putting a lot of effort into not just our market reports, but our market videos. So, so if you are a CoStar user, please check those out and, and reshare them. We, we put a lot of time into it, and hopefully it's valuable for you all to, to check those out and understand what's going on in the market real time. Perfect. Well, David, again, we really appreciate you coming on the show today. And thank you so much for your time and sharing what you guys are seeing in the office market. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. All right, listeners, that's all we've got for today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please send us a note to podcast at realcrowd.com. And with that, we'll catch you in the next one. Mm-hmm.